it's a pleasure to be back here to give the grand round. And uh, uh, the grand round is going to be, um, you know, full of interesting cases. Uh, most of these are my own cases, and I also adopted two cases uh, from uh, my colleagues that I got from presentations from ophthalmic pathology meetings. So you might see a difference in the outline uh, indicating these two uh, specific cases, but I thought they are also interesting and useful to you. Uh, I want the residents to pay attention to the pretest because you are the ones who are going to answer the questions again. There are just few questions, and they are the answers are all embedded in the uh, in the grand round. So I will know whether you paid attention or not. This is the pretest. First question is in regard to fungal keratitis. You can go through it. I'll just give you a few seconds and keep the answer. You know, either in your mind or just write the uh, answer that you think is correct. Uh, write it down. That's question number one. Shall we move to two? Yes. Fungal keratitis accounting for more than 60% of all cases of ulcerative keratitis. The second point is related to the, to the compromised corneas. Third one is re related to a study done previously here at the KKH. And the last one is related to the yeast infection. Second question is in association with pigmented hypopian as a clinical observation. Again, um, listeria is a common organism, pink hypopian associated with Klebschilla for, because of a red pigment produced by the organism, intraocular malignancy is rarely suspected, and the minority are presumed to be endogenous. That's question two. Number three is related to microsporidiosis in relation to the immune status of the patient and diagnosing it by culture, the root of infection, and also description of the organism. The last one is on prothecosis. I know this might be a bit um, unusual because uh, we actually reported the first case he's in, here in the Middle East, but uh, you will come to know more information about this uh, condition or this infection. Uh, it's related to the uh, species themselves, the immune status again of the patient, uh, a specific um, patho uh, pathogenic uh, strain, uh, that uh, might cause corneal graft infection. You, you, I don't know whether this is right or wrong at this stage, uh, and the treatment. And before I really start the cases, I'm honored and pleased that Professor Tabara is here. Uh, I would like him to give us any valuable uh, comments uh, by the end of the lecture, of course. Uh, the first case is a 33-year-old Saudi male. He's a known case of keratoconus with acute hydrops and had a penetrating keratoplasty with no complications. It was done actually in a private center. And one month after, he developed some haze, anterior chamber reaction, some pigmented KPs, but no definite infiltrate. And this is the clinical appearance. Uh, I do remember that the attending came um, to visit me in my office, and he said, this is kind of a puzzling case. Maybe it's just a reaction or, you know, like um, just inflammation because of the procedure, but we are not sure. So the decision was to take an anterior chamber tab, and he said, I'm going to send this to you. Uh, at this stage, I remembered a case that I uh, came across in one of my ophthalmic pathology meetings. Uh, it was uh, courtesy of Dr. Noura uh, from the Tufts Medical Center. So I went, you know, um, ahead and reviewed that case quickly because in our meetings we are um, supposed to give the protocol and the presentation to every single member in the uh, ophthalmic pathology uh, society. So. Um, I, t I told him on the spot, you know what, I think I know the diagnosis and I, th I know the organism. You're going to give me 100 reals if I'm correct, out of the anterior chamber tab. So uh, I will also tackle that case later on, but I will continue with our first case. So he did the, send us the anterior chamber tab, and these are the smears. Um, uh, and this is the PS stain. I'm sure you know what is this stain, the residence. Come on. That's easy. The second stain is what? GMS, and you can see the yeast organisms. So um, at this stage, he was treated accordingly, in addition to uh, PRED-40 drops as well, and Timolol because of high, uh, secondary high intraocular pressure, and remained stable for a while. Then again, after six months, developed some sort of infiltrate. I just elected to uh, show you here the, the infiltrate, mainly at the suture line. So it's all around the, the, uh, the area of the graft uh, only. Um, and uh, mainly at the suture line. And if you see this, 
this picture. This is just the initial one before the tab, and you can compare it to the uh, progression after six months. Not too much difference, but there is a noticeable difference. So at this stage, uh, he was uh, referred to the uh, eye hospital actually here and had a corneal biopsy, which further confirmed the same yeast, but it was, of course, better organized this time because it was within the uh, tissue by GMS, and it was also further uh, identified by culture to be candida parapsilosis. Um, the second case um, is the one that I adopted I, and I reviewed and I figured out that it might be, um, you know, the same uh, organism. However, the presentation is completely different because that patient had uh, um, uh, cataract extraction. So it's not only a minor procedure to the cornea alone. He was an 89-year-old um, patient who presented with some abnormal discharge, uh, nothing significant that much in his um, uh, in his history, uh, except that he had the cataract surgery, as I told you, with intraocular lens implantation about two years and a half earlier. So this tells you how long was the, uh, was the history of recurrent, you know, also on and off uh, uh, inflammation-like picture. Um, he developed a fungal endophthalmitis at one stage during the clinical course and underwent the pars plan of vitrectomy and removal of the intraocular lens, and the culture indeed at that time confirmed the candida parapsilosis, so the same type of infection. But uh, the patient, in spite of all this and in spite of the, um, of the, uh, of the treatment, he still um, developed some sort of flares up uh, every now and then, and every time he was treated with amphotericin B and uh, intravenous also variconazole, so he was really covered well. Uh, and until he developed a central corneal opacity uh, uh, two years uh, after and an endothelial plague, and they were not happy about the appearance of the cornea, as you can see here. So they went ahead and um, continued the treatment, but eventually he had a penetrating keratoplasty for that eye because of this corneal opacity. Again, the histopathology of the corneal specimen itself revealed the same type of organism, uh, and the same yeast also um, at the level of dismiss membrane uh, with the PA stain as well as the GMS stain. Uh, again, the patient did not really do well. Uh, he had very poor vision, and um, he started to uh, have det further deterioration with necrosis uh, and area of perforation, as you can see here. So he has been so unfortunate. And um, uh, he was referred for evisceration. The evisceration specimen also showed very uh, similar uh, findings to the uh, previous. Um, uh, the weird thing is that um, uh, like one month after the attending came to me with that anterior chamber tab and he referred the case here, um, we had another case with, with a longer history. I'll go through the history first and then I'll tell you what was in my mind. Um, the second case uh, was an 82-year-old Saudi male. He had uh, bilateral corneal scarring and actually one of the eyes was physical with um, with light perception only, uh, vision, um, and we were mainly concerned about the uh, right eye, of course, because um, um, it was the, um, the, the seeing eye, although the vision was really poor. Uh, and uh, he gave history of penetrating keratoplasty with ECCE uh, and posterior chamber lens long time ago and failure of the graft. So the specimen I received was actually his second PKP, not the first. The first one was done elsewhere, and I, I don't have any record of it. Uh, so the second PKP, the thing that attracted my attention is that it was done in the same private center that, uh, you know, had the first case that I showed you earlier. Um, he uh, developed persistent epithelial defect after this second graft. Uh, they did medial tarsography, a mutic membrane transplant. He, again, did not do uh, well. Uh, he developed uh, the persistent epithelial defect o over 85% of the graft, and um, the, um, uh, the, at this stage, uh, it was decided also that he might have uh, some infection. Uh, based on the anterior chamber washout at that time and the um, diagnosis of fungal infection, uh, a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty for the second graft uh, was, uh, was decided, and the uh, corneal specimen was sent. Uh, there was an evidence of ulceration, numerous yeast, again, here with the PS stain and uh, with the GMS stain, and um, they also did anterior chamber wash out, and you can see also the presence of the yeast behind uh, decimus membrane. Um, so, uh, and it was, uh, the case was also proved to be candida parapsilosis uh, at the end, so the same type of infection. Um, no other intervention was taken uh, later on, but he unfortunately developed choroidal uh, detachment, and again, he didn't really do well. This, is, this was the uh, follow-up with a very hazy uh, graft and localized retinal detachment. So just a few words about the fungal infection 
section of the corneas. Um, it constitutes about in all over the, the papers or the literature review that I did. Uh, it's, it's variable, of course, but between 6 to 53 percent of all assertive keratitis, mostly following trauma with plant material. I'm sure you know most of this stuff. Um, and the majority are caused by septate filamentous uh, fungi. But however, the compromised corneas, like in dry eyes or other conditions, they are subjected to uh, yeast infection, mostly the candida. Um, the uh, uh, case I presented from Tufts uh, was endophthalmitis, so that's why they had this overview table of all the fungal um, uh, eye infections, including the endophthalmitis and uh, whether endogenous or exogenous, and the keratitis. But in my presentation, I concentrated mainly on the uh, keratitis as such. Uh, in regard to the yeast infection of the corneas, there are several species associated with post-traumatic keratitis, uh, other species associated with infectious crystalline keratopathy, and all in all, the most commonly isolated one, of course, is the candida albicans. However, it was noticed when I did the literature review that the candida parapsilosis is becoming more and more evident. So I wanted to look into it and see why is it becoming increasing in frequency. So um, um, I found out that it affects usually neonates ICU patients, and it's related to, uh, to the devices that you use in, in such uh, uh, you know, uh, circumstances. Uh, and it can happen also as outbreaks in the hospital where the hands of the health healthcare workers were the predominant you know, source of infection. The pathogenesis in general uh, of the fungal uh, keratitis is related to phospholipases and proteases, certain enzymes. But in the case of the candida parapsilosis in particular, these did not really show in the literature review to be uh, really the, core, the, the, the reason why it's um, virulent. On the other hand, something else was discovered in the candida parapsilosis, which is the uh, affinity of it for adherence to surfaces, and maybe that's why it happens in ICU and it's related to devices, uh, because of formation of a specific biofilm. So this adhesion feature seems to be uh, uh, critical in the acquiring the infection from an exogenous source, then ad adherence to the device, as I said, and then finally invading the host. The management, uh, again, antifungal and, uh, and surgery, uh, all in all in, in, in general. And uh, it was kind of interesting for me to have these two cases within a short period of time coming from the same center. So I had to highlight this to the uh, person who uh, brought us, uh, you know, the specimens as, as consultation, uh, possibly to do something about the health workers there in that place. Uh, in the same line of the um, fungal uh, uh, keratitis or infection of the corneas, I also adopted another interesting case, and it's kind of rare and unusual, so I thought I'll present it also to you from uh, one of my colleagues in, uh, in Canada. Uh, in one of the Canadian also ophthalmic pathology meetings. Uh, that one was a 57-year-old uh, female uh, who's known to be a contact lens wearer. Uh, she didn't um, uh, give any history of, uh, of trauma, but uh, the eye that was affected uh, with an corneal ulcer, which is the left eye, uh, was an amblyopic uh, eye because of strabismus. Uh, she was, um, um, uh, this is the appearance, the clinical appearance of the, uh, of the, of the eye. And uh, the patient uh, at that time were thought to be uh, having uh, herpetic keratitis, but the scraping also showed few fungal elements, so uh, the patient was treated uh, accordingly. Uh, but the culture later on uh, came to be uh, consistent with uh, Pisilomyces uh, lilacinus, uh, and she was kept on the antifungal uh, therapy. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but eventually, again, the prognosis was not really good. She had loss of vision and um, um, further deterioration, necessitating therapeutic keratoplasty, and this is the appearance of the uh, cornea with the uh, uh, acute inflammation and uh, necrosis, in addition to the fungal elements by the PS as well as the uh, GMS stain. Uh, the patient didn't also do the very well even after the therapeutic uh, keratoplasty and um, uh, developed some sort of uh, scleritis. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know whether she really had uh, any further uh, procedure done or, or not because this was not really our case. So I thought I'll give you a few words also on this uh, uh, specific infection, the Pisilomyces species. Uh, they are filamentous uh, saprophytic fungi uh, and uh, they can um, uh, be acquired from fruits, vegetables, tap water or uh, contaminants in laboratories. Um, this is the appearance of the species. Uh, they are usually non-pathogenic in humans. That's why they are really very rare. Uh, but they can cause severe infection in humans, and uh, specifically the dilacinus and um, uh, other two uh, strains. Uh, in the body, they can affect several uh, orga uh, organs, but in the eye, they can cause either endophthalmitis or keratitis or scleritis. 
the fungal keratitis in specific um, is not, it's not really common, as I told you. Like, for example, in a very um, huge case series uh, in Pascom Palmer Institute, the, this species caused only 2.9% of the cases. Uh, the lilacinus infection in, in particular, why did we call it so? Do you, do you, are you familiar with the word li uh, lilac? The females would know. So uh, it's because lilac color is just a light purple, purplish uh, color. So the colonies will actually, um, uh, on culture, give you this kind of color. Um, so that's why this name is uh, acquired. Uh, they happen, uh, I mean, because of some risk factors like contact lens wear, especially if the hygiene is not uh, good or if there's an epithelial defect. Uh, topical corticosteroid is another risk factor as well as trauma. The uh, keratitis can go ahead, I mean, like, and deteriorate, giving rise to endophthalmitis, and you really need to give aggressive uh, treatment. The endophthalmitis is, is, is such can be associated also uh, or related to the intraocular uh, lens. Uh, for example, in one of the series, uh, this was actually the larger series considered that this organism is rare, uh, 13 cases, uh, it was uh, related to the solution, contaminated solution uh, that was used during the surgery, and eight out of these 13 ended up by actually enucleation, so very bad uh, outcome. Uh, so in, in such cases, you have to um, keep, you know, diagnose it very early, and uh, they need prolonged medical uh, treatment, and of course, limitation of the corticosteroid use. Uh, now we'll move to another uh, type of, uh, of infection, a 42-year-old Saudi male uh, who presented with tearing uh, and pain and redness in the uh, right eye. There was no history of trauma, but the patient was uh, diabetic. The uh, slit lamp examination showed corneal epithelial defect with traumal infiltrate, and the preliminary diagnosis at, at that time was herpetic stromal keratitis, and the patient did improve uh, dramatically with the bigamox and the corresponding treatment uh, as herpetic. But one month later, so we were not really consulted at this stage, the patient developed again painful red eye with uh, further deterioration of the vision and a corneal uh, absence. She was also started on the same treatment, but did not improve. So, they, so she needed a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty in the right eye, and that was sent to microbiology. And at this stage, we really diagnosed the uh, possibility of microsporidia uh, by histopathology as well, and that's the acid fast uh, stain with the classic uh, appearance of the microsporidium um, uh, organisms. We managed also to do electron microscopy, which further confirmed the diagnosis, and we actually sent it abroad to get the species uh, identified. Um, the patient also had a clear graft for two years, but later on still developed corneal abscess. So these cases, at the end, they usually don't do really well. Um, again, when I, I, I had this case, I was so excited about it. I went ahead and presented it in one of the ophthalmic pathology meetings, and uh, they were discussing it, and they said, you are supposed to find in a big, you know, um, at that time I was at the KKH, so they said in a big uh, referral center, you should have one case every 10 years. I told them, well, this is the first case, and it's almost like 25 years um, of practice in the hospital. And then they said, well, we don't know why. Anyhow, I came back, and another case came. So maybe the ratio is correct, you know, like one every 10 years, approximately. So the other case was a 53-year-old Saudi female. Again, fe uh, redness and pain and reduced vision in the right eye for several uh, months with ciliary injection. Um, uh, the patient also uh, had the therapeutic um, uh, keratoplasty and with the same uh, similar organism. But this case, we were not really prepared for the diagnosis, so the EM was done on from the block, so the yield was not really very good. You can see the difference between the picture here and the picture, the previous one. But uh, it was still, we were you know, convinced with a microsporidium uh, diagnosis. Uh, it was confirmed by histopathology anyhow. Uh, again, the prognosis was not really very well. Um, Afterwards, she had a failed graft with iris adhesions, but the patient uh, declined to have another penetrating keratoplasty. So a few words about the microsporidia, and pay attention because there's one question about this. Uh, they are obligate intracellular uh, protozoan parasites, uh, and they uh, have specific infective and disease process, um, mostly in the immunocompromised uh, patients. Uh, they can happen at two settings, either isolated or part of systemic infection, and two main forms are recognized. This is important. Uh, in immunocompromised individuals, you're going to get keratoconjunctivitis. In immunocompetent individuals, they usually present as traumal keratitis. That's the difference. Source of infection is thought to be fecal oral or direct Enucleation. So, as we said, the um, about the source of uh, of infection and the direct enucleation can happen either from infected persons or from uh, domestic animals such as cats. 
um, enters. The, uh, for the diagnosis, you can either diagnose it as we did with the histology uh, or electromicroscopy as well. Culture is difficult because they are intracellular organisms, and uh, there are recently also some several molecular techniques that can be used. Uh, so far, there is no exact definitive medical treatment, but you can use uh, propamidine and etraconazole uh, as well, um, which prove to be um, uh, helpful. Uh, the um, uh, seventh case is um, a 28-year-old uh, male who presented to the emergency room with pain and redness in the right eye, otherwise healthy. The only positive thing in the ocular uh, history is laser refractive surgery only. So that was really, you know, amazing to me uh, that he came with infection. You know, it's not a corneal transplant, it's not a cataract extraction, it's just a laser refractive surgery six months after. He presented with high pressure and some, um, you know, um, uh, also a flare and, and reaction in the anterior chamber. That's why he received fortified antibiotics and topical uh, steroids. The intraocular pressure was uh, kind of controlled, uh, but it, something else was noticed also along the course, which is a dark pigmented uh, hypopion with no further view of the posterior cavity. This is the appearance of the patient with the hypopion, and there was no real corneal infiltrate, just a ring of deep stromal haze, as you can see here at the uh, red arrow. This is the left eye, which was completely normal. So he was admitted as a case of uveitis and uh, tested for uh, HIV, which was negative. Um, and uh, the B scan at that time was not suggestive of endophthalmitis. For the residents, what would you think of at this stage? I mean, like, okay, inflammation, and what else with this such pigmented hypopene? You think of Mascaradia syndrome as well. So that was thought of as well. But he was treated as a case of herpetic with um, Valtrex in addition to moxifloxacin and um, antibiotics as well and topical steroids. The B-scan uh, later on along the course was suggestive of early endothelmitis. This is on admission. That was one day after. And this was four days later uh, with the thickening suggestive of er early endothelmitis. So uh, the anterior chamber washout and vitreous tab with ant intravitreal antibiotic was uh, performed. The smears showed the uh, melanin granules and lots of polymorph nuclear leukocytes, uh, but no definite uh, um, uh, organisms and no malignant cells as well. And the special stains for organisms were all negative. So we went ahead and did also PCR to rule out infectious etiology. It was also still negative. However, we, we thought, you know, no, it doesn't look like herpetic, and it's not masquerade syndrome because we didn't see any malignant cells. At that time, the culture came back from the aqueous fluid, and it proved to be listeria monocytogenes in the blood agar. And uh, this is the appearance of the um, colonies. Um, the vitreous culture later on also uh, showed a gram-positive bacilli, but no further identification was done because we believed it's, it's the same organism. The patient was treated accordingly, but then developed cataracts. So you see the prognosis always is not really very good. He, so underwent fecal emulsification with an IOL uh, implementation, um, uh, and at that time the anterior fl f uh, chamber fluid uh, at the time of the cataract was uh, you know, taken for culture, but it was negative. That's the appearance of the cataract and then the intraocular lens. Uh, one month following this, the vision was kind of stable, uh, and he was controlled with a single antiglucoma medication, uh, but still the cornea was not really great. The intraocular lens was kind of stable, but little bit tilted, so again, the prognosis is not really uh, great. A uh, few words about the listeria uh, as such. Um, it's an aerobic gram-positive um, uh, bacillus. Uh, the name is acquired because of its ability to elicit monocytic blood reaction in the animal uh, host, and it produces beta hemolysis also on blood uh, agar. Uh, it has been recognized as an I mean, animal pathogen to start with, uh, and most infections uh, are uh, sporadic, but outbreaks can still happen. The uh, source of infection is believed to be uh, foodborne um, in, uh, in epidemic and sporadic uh, cases. The varieties of food that can carry this would be soft cheeses, raw vegetable, milk, fish, and, uh, and meat. Um, the infections usually affect neonates, pregnant women, elderly patients. Uh, so generally speaking, people who have some sort of immunosuppression or immunocompromise. Uh, but it still can happen in healthy persons, so you have to keep this in mind. In regard to the ocular listeriosis as such, it's generally rare. Uh, it, most frequently it happens in the form of conjunctivitis, but it can also cause endothalmitis. First case of endothalmitis was actually reported in 1967, and then following this, several cases uh, were presented. But these 
these cases were, did not have dark hypopion. I managed to find a very good uh, review by Elliot in 1992. Um, he reviewed all 14 uh, cases um, of endophthalmitis caused by listeria, um, and the, uh, the, the cases reviewed were presumed to be all endogenous. Uh, and they related the dark brown color to the iris necrosis necrosis and the pigment dispersion. So uh, that was the reason. And out of his cases, five only had the uh, dark hypopion. And I looked further into other uh, reviews, and this table just shows you uh, that the majority of the patients with dark hypopion are co co uh, caused by listeria. Uh, but there are two specific uh, uh, case reports uh, where the hypopion was pink, and they were related to serratia and klebsiella. So the pigmented dark hypopion is caused, uh, mostly caused by listeria, as I mentioned, uh, because of the pigment uh, dispersion, uh, but it can happen also by other infectious agents. Uh, the, um, the other conditions you have to keep in mind also are the melanoma and the juvenile xanthogranuloma because they can give you also a pigmented uh, sort of hypopion. In regard to the pink hypopion in particular, the serratia is um, uh, pr um, you know, known to cause this pink hypopion because of a red pigment, uh, which is used as a useful mark in impact, uh, marker in bacteremia after dental extractions, uh, while the klebsiella um, causes a brick red. It's not really uh, pink, or um, uh, in the, uh, especially in the sputum of patients with klebsiella uh, pneumonia. The ocular listeriosis diagnosis is often delayed, and this, of course, adversely affects the prognosis like in our uh, case. Uh, ultrasound can be helpful. Uh, PCR as well uh, might be helpful in the diagnosis. Now, the um, uh, last case was um, a 72-year-old uh, lady with history of diabetes and hypertension. This is completely a different, uh, it's a periocular infection rather than uh, keratitis. Uh, she had a tender swelling in the left medial uh, canthal area, um, and um, uh, she had a dacrocystectomy on that side. Uh, but then afterwards, she developed non-necrotizing, uh, at that time, the histopathology showed non-necrotizing granulomatous inflammation, but we didn't really see organisms, and we didn't really have explanation for this granuloma, uh, granulomatous um, uh, inflammation. Uh, Postoperatively, two weeks after, she had a non-tender uh, swelling in the area, with cheese wiring and deep necrosis, uh, necrosis reaching the medial canthus. Um, they, at this stage, they thought of Wagner's granulomatosis with this uh, picture. And they did work her up, but it didn't really uh, prove the Wagner's. So they decided to go for the deprived irrigation with amphotericin B and flagyl. Uh, and um, the stains at this time were negative. Uh, but with the histopathology, we managed to see the same granulomatous inflammation we saw the first time in addition to areas of necrosis. But we saw very weird spore-like organisms within this necrotic tissue. Some of them are staining with the, uh, uh, with the gram stain. This is a higher power of the organism uh, engulfed by a giant cell. Um, and this is the appearance with the gram stain as well as the GMS uh, stain. And at this stage, we diagnosed the case as prototycosis. That was uh, Dr. Osama al Sheikh case, and we managed eventually to, um, to publish it. Uh, the postoperatively, the patient did uh, well with a healthy wound. So I'll just give you brief um, words about the, this entity. Uh, it's a very rare infection in human and animals uh, caused by uh, achlorophilic algae of the genus Prototheca. This is different from the chlorellosis, by the way, because in chlorellosis it's also an algae, but they have the uh, chlorophores or the pigment. Uh, they are aerobic unicellular spherical uh, non-budding organism of low virulence, and they cause low-grade acute or chronic infections, and they are considered saprophytic uh, all in all. The human infection can happen as cutaneous or subcutaneous, so to me this is periocular, so possibly also like sort of a subcutaneous infection. Uh, but they still can cause bursitis and disseminated disease, especially in, in animals. The pathogenesis is unclear, uh, but the organism is thought to infect the humans through direct contact with some sources, again, uh, contaminated water or soil. The, um, uh, most of the infections will happen with immunosuppression or in cases where the patient has some sort of immunocompromised uh, uh, patient. Uh, like, for example, in our patient, she was diabetic. But be, keep in mind that there is a specific uh, um, strain of, of, of uh, prototheca, uh, which is the most common pathogenic strain in human, and it's reported to cause corneal graft infection in an immunocompetent patient, so it can still happen. The recognition can happen uh, by direct observation of the tissue and, uh, or isolation of the algae itself in the uh, culture. Uh, they can be seen with the H&E uh, stain, uh, and especially highlighted with the PS, uh, with the PS and the GMS, as we uh, have shown. This was taken actually from, um, um, you know, the, the internet, because this shows a heavy, uh, you know, like organism, not like in our uh, case, but just to show you the appearance of um, the, um, the modular like uh, that I will uh, also sh show you later on. Uh, and this is our uh, case. 
The, uh, by electron microscopy, as I said, they have typical um, uh, sporangia that are filled with endospores with a characteristic shape uh, called morula. Uh, the morula is symmetrical in the um, uh, prototheca wicker hammy, but it shows uh, and shows cartwheel or flower-like configuration, while in other strains it can show random appearance. Real uh, PCR can be also used as a diagnostic tool. Uh, this was not from our case. I thought I'll just show you this because it's the most clear and the resemblance of the uh, of the case in our in ours. The treatment, there are no standardized treatment regimen, but amphotericin B is the most frequently uh, used agent, either alone or in combi combination with tetracycline. Again, surgical excision, if it's a small localized lesion, as we, uh, what we did in our patient, is also beneficial, and our patient really did very well. So you have to keep this type of infection in your mind, even if it is uh, really uh, rare. So we'll go back to our uh, questions, and I want somebody to answer. First question. Everything was in the lecture, so you don't have any excuse. The following statement is true in fungal keratitis. Which one is true? Okay, so the C, it's actually the, um, the uh, in, in our study here that was done in KKH, the filamentous fungi accounted for about 70% of the cases. This will give you the, the, um, the answers. Uh, in all the literature, the range was from 6 to 53% of all cases out of the alternative ones. Uh, the abnormal corneas, as I mentioned in my lecture, they will be commonly uh, affected by yeast rather than the uh, septate fung fungi. The candida albicans is the most commonly isolated yeast, it's true, but the, for, uh, for the parapsilosis, it's usually acquired from an exogenous source, not endogenous. You remember we said they have a tendency to produce biofilm and then adhere to the uh, devices. The second question, which is regard to the pigmented hypopion. Okay, what did we say when we said about the pink hypopion? Yeah, the red pigment is actually caused by serration, not by the clipshilla. And the clipshilla gives you a little bit darker uh, currant jelly like, uh, okay. So listeria is the common, really, is the commonest out of all of them. And the pink hypopion is the serration that produces the red pigment in, in reality. Intraocular malignancy, you have to think about it in such cases, and you have to suspect it. And uh, all the previously reported cases, they were actually endogenous. Okay, the third one, ocular microsporidosis. Okay, so it is B. Uh, they are mostly seen in immunocompromised. If they are seen in immunocompromised, as I said, they will cause keratoconjunctivitis. Okay, not stromal keratitis, and vice versa. Uh, fecal oral root is not the only one. It can happen by direct nucleation as well, and they are intracellular. Remember that. That's why the culture is difficult. The last one, it was the last case, you have to remember the answer. Okay, yeah, it is true, all right? So they are of low virulence, not high virulence, and usually it's related to the immune condition of the patient. Amphotericin B is the most frequently uh, used agent for the uh, treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Katan, for presenting these unusual cases of infection. Uh, I'm also delighted to have Professor Tabara here to give, uh, give us uh, his uh, thoughts about the lecture. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Uh, very nice collection of cases. Thank you. Uh, just to tell you that Prototheca is a, a green algae, and it's not a fungus. No, it's not a fungus. It's, it's an, an algae. algae. Mm -hmm. It's a green algae. It's extremely rare infection in humans. It is uh, reported mostly in dogs, cattle, uh, and it can cause infections like gastroenteritis and other manifestations in cattle. So, but in man, protophicosis is a very rare infection, just to keep yeah. in mind. And I'm not sure about even the, the, the efficacy of amphotericin B. We don't have wide experience with it. So, uh, because it's an algae, it's a little bit different from mm -hmm. fungi. Now, regarding the pink hypopian uh, that we reported, it was the first case that was reported, a pink hypopian mm -hmm. in the literature in the British Journal of Thermology. Uh, this was a baby, a newborn, mm -hmm. that got an endogenous endophthalmitis in the pink hypopian. 
the reason why we reported it, because we thought it was a high femur. And, mm -hmm. uh, and when we took a, an anterior chamber tap, we found the serration of mercedes. And uh, it is well known that serratia mercedes, mercedes present, uh, produces a pink color mm -hmm. pigment in colonies. And it was used by the Phoenicians for dyeing of uh, cloth be mm -hmm. because of the pigments that they used to have. They used to expose them to the sun and they got the, the pigment from it. So it's uh, an organism which is not very rare, but uh, it can, co it can uh, change the diagnosis because you think that this could be a hyphemia with the, with the, with the hypopia. Uh, now about listeria, uh, we reported cases of listeria causing endogenous, uh, uh, I mean, uh, endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis, yeah. But the cases that we reported were not due to endogenous mm -hmm. listeriosis. Uh, they were due to keratoconjunctivitis. In fact, it's one of the major economic loss in, in cattle farms is that uh, cattle may develop listeria keratoconjunctivitis. And uh, following the keratoconjunctivitis, the organism, it's one of the rare organisms that can penetrate intact tissue and go inside the eye and produces endophthalmitis. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering about the 1992 report by Elliot that all the cases were endogenous. That was only keratitis. This was yeah, the, because when you do the literature search, you will find lots yeah. of endophthalmitis uh, cases, yeah. so I concentrated but, on the keratitis only. Yeah, but what I'm saying is mm -hmm. that you can get a keratoconjunctivitis, and this is the usual manifestations in animals in, uh, due to listeria. Mm -hmm. And uh, early diagnosis of listeria keratoconjunctivitis, this is why I say that when you, ha when you have a case of purulent uh, cases of keratoconjunctivitis, you should take cultures because you can miss cases like this. You mm -hmm. know, two organisms that comes to my mind that can be uh, major causes of endophthalmitis is gonorrhea and listeria. Mm -hmm. Both can penetrate and cause uh, uh, endophthalmitis. So one has to be careful when they, when you get, uh, if not all cases of conjunctivitis respond to a regular treatment. Yeah. The point about the fungi, I just want to say that uh, we should not always rely on the literature and what has been reported in the literature. Uh, when they say, for instance, in the States, candida is the most common cause of fungal keratitis in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Fusarium is the most common cause of fungal keratitis in Florida because of the humid weather and the hot weather. Yeah. In Saudi Arabia, we studied the regional differences mm -hmm. between Najd and the Western region, and found out that in the Western region, we see more cases of fusarium. Mm -hmm. And in Najd, we see more of aspergillosis, aspergilla, aspergillus uh, keratitis. And the reason is that the spores of aspergillus can withstand temperature up to 65 degrees Celsius. So they are not killed here by the hot weather, mm -hmm. and they survive. Candida and species and other organisms do not survive in this atmosphere. So this is why people from Najd, if you have fungal keratitis, you have to think of uh, Aspergillus as number one, and we found Aspergillus as the most common organism causing keratitis here. Mm -hmm. in, in this. So, uh, so we should not rely on what's reported elsewhere, and we should rely on our epidemiological research, mm -hmm. like yours in here, in that we had it here, about the distribution in the different region of fungal. If coming to microsporidiosis, microsporidia is a unicellular eukaryote, and it is an intracellular, an obligate intracellular parasite that lives inside the cells. 
So where are the cells mostly? They are mostly on the epithelium. So the infection in microsporidiosis is mostly an epithelial keratitis initially. Mm -hmm. And it is missed as dry eyes, as uh, herpes, mm -hmm. and they are given topical steroids, antiviral agents, and so forth until the microsporidia goes into the stroma and causes the stromal keratitis. So the stromal keratitis is not an initial manifestation of microsporidiosis. In the past 10 days, I have seen three cases of microsporidiosis. You said you saw one in 10 years. Yeah. And this is because you are in a tertiary care facility. Mm -hmm. And in the primary care, these are missed. And all one of the cases was seen in London and diagnosed as dry eyes because of the epithelial keratitis and the punctate staining. Mm -hmm. When we did scrapings, we saw microsporidia. And all what I did in these three cases is to give them fumagillin, two milligram per ml, and all three patients responded within 48 hours with complete healing of the epithelial keratitis. So what I'm trying to say that this is a misdiagnosis, it's a commonly missed, it can have a self-limited course in immunocompetent patients, but if you give them steroids, you decrease their immunity and allow the microsporidia to go into the stroma and cause mm -hmm. the stromal keratitis. So I just want to bring up to the residents the fact that you sh they should think about it in differential diagnosis as, as an epithelial keratitis. You are right. Here, you don't see it because you don't uh, deal with large immunocompromised population like mm -hmm. patients with AIDS and so forth who develop keratoconjunctivitis, as you mentioned. But, but the microsporidiosis is, is here. And the, the best treatment for it is fumagillin. The interesting thing is that fumagillin is an enzyme produced, a protein produced by Aspergillus fumigatus. And fumigatus, microsper the uh, Aspergillus, uses it to kill microorganisms around it, like microsporidia, that are sharing their food resources. So what happens is that in nature, they they develop these defense mechanisms to preserve their food resources. And this is what, uh, what Aspergillus does. So microsporidiosis is not uncommon. It is a, a something that we have to keep look, looking for it and to consider it in differential diagnosis of an epithelial keratitis. Because most frequently they are diagnosed as herpes. They can mm -hmm. be like lines. In the, in the epithelium, uh, as I saw, when one of the cases I saw, it was like the form lesion, but it was a punctate keratitis. So uh, these are just few points about the cases that you might, they are all very interesting cases. And the, the Pycelopsis uh, candida is mostly a, an iatrogenic or uh, infection. And there are several epidemics that happened in yeah. following cataract surgery or following PKPs. And uh, they, are, they, they do happen, but they are not commonly as a primary manifestation of a, uh, of a fungal keratitis. And keep in mind that candida is rare in the Najd region, in the central region. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much Thank for you. your valuable information. Yeah. Any further questions? Sorry, Dr. Samar. Yes. Thank you. So uh, I just want to uh, bring an attention to the first two cases which you presented with infection following keratoplasties. Mm -hmm. uh, so the standard, uh, standard protocol and it's all uh, in the standard procedure by all cornea transplant is that to culture the cornea uh, donor grants. Um, th that surgery was done outside the. Yes. Facility, and we don't know who is the donor uh, I bank the 
other sources. So uh, one thing that uh, we keep in mind is that we culture it not because we're worried about the bacteria, mm -hmm. in fact, because we're worried about the uh, contamination. In early 2000, Kekesh reported two cases. Uh, we infected donors uh, with the candidates. And uh, following that, other reports also appeared in the literature. Um, and we know that if an infection occurred in the first few weeks, we keep in mind the, the, the uh, contamination during mm -hmm. the preparation or probably uh, during the OR setting itself with the worker, uh, the one who handled these cases. So um, the, the, um, the, the clinical presentation was really very typical about the research and lines that we mm -hmm. presented. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this again uh, brings the attention that even if we receive tissue from any other uh, patient from uh, other uh, mm -hmm. facilities, that we need to, uh, to, to be careful with the candidate as a person. The other thing, I wouldn't look into the same fear or anything because that doesn't present in the group we usually present in the same but that one is very typical. Mm. Uh, I noticed that the patient was treated by polyphenol just uh, four times or something like that, uh, and kept on that bridge. Uh, that also bring it attention to that this should be taken care of, you know, uh, and as for potential interest. Mm. So what happens if we get a, a positive donor some studies here. So if we have any uh, uh, warning from the uh, microbiology that you have a positive donor for uh, a fungi, the standard protocol is that you have to put a patient on the active uh, antifungal, uh, preferably it's antifungal uh, for one to two months and then keep on observing that patient slowly. Uh, we cannot be the patient from steroids because the surgery is very important. But mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So you still give the empirical therapy prophylactic if the donor tissue proved to is, have a positive culture? Yeah, okay. This is standard care, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, by all point of the uh, surgeries. Thank you. Dr. Stone, please. Sorry, Dr. Stone. Yes, Dr. Katan, thank you so much. That's a, a great series of cases, and I think really highlight for the residents and fellows the often importance of diagnostic testing such as corneal biopsy to establish the diagnosis in some of these cases. Um, do you have any, any words of wisdom for the fellows and residents as they, as they are taking care of our patients and a patient is not responding to therapy and we suspect perhaps an unusual organism? As a pathologist, what do you want to see from the biopsy specimen? How can we do a better job providing you the required tissue to make the diagnosis? Okay, the first thing is communication. Communication with full information about the patient and the course, the clinical course, how did everything start and so on. Uh, for us, uh, because of the point that Prof. Tabara mentioned about the microsporidia, in some hospitals they used to do only GMS and gram as stains for any possible infection. We added acid fast now as a routine. Uh, so this helps as well. Uh, for the residents, I would like to have always a piece sent for microbiology, a fresh that's not in, in formalin. Uh, for us, the formal fixed tissue is still fine. We still can manage with the, with the stains. Uh, again, PCR to be considered if they are suspecting, um, you know, herpetic or depending on the, on the institution, what sort of available PCR tests they have. So this needs to be sent also as fresh and sterile. Uh, so keep always this in mind. And uh, if you communicate with us, we will lead you. I mean, like we can direct the, you know, the, uh, the specimen characterization and the, uh, the choice of the investigation to, to be done accordingly. I don't know if Dr. Maktabi has anything else to add. As you mentioned, communication is very important because uh, giving a good detailed history, this helps us a lot. Yeah, Prof. Stabar, yes, Stabar. Yeah, you Prof. Know, if you are in private practice and mm -hmm. you don't have access to PCR and so forth, you can, you can make the diagnosis of microsporidiosis by gram stain and gimsa. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, it is very easy to see them. They are, they are, as you mentioned, they are two to five micrometers in, in uh, Yeah, they are not really sm very small. Not I mean, like very you can, small. Yeah, you yeah, can see you them. Can, you can mm. see them if you are looking for them. And you can see them intracellular in some of these. Keep in mind, if you, if you read our, our recent book on ocular infection, mm -hmm. our first book on ocular infection, we classified microsporidiosis under the protozoa. Now, with the new nomenclature, Microsporidia is a fungus. 
So it is on, in mycology now. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's classified as a variant of a fungus and not a protozoa. Although it's a eukaryote mm -hmm. and it's unicellular, it's an intracellular uh, parasite, but it's not a protozoa as, as it used to be in the literature. Thank you. If, you. if you are in private, you can come to us. Bring your specimens to us. <laughs> Then, so we'll conclude. Thank you very much, Dr. Katani, okay, thank thank you. for the audience.